on Sky News Business. This is Business Class. Hi, I'm James Wilkinson and welcome to Business Class. Today's show is coming to you from New York City, which has just been playing host to two of the leading hotel conferences in the world. Before we catch up with some of the leading hotel CEOs, here's this week's travel news. In travel news this week, Qantas has revealed that it is increasing flights to several Asia-Pacific destinations later this year on the back of demand. From December 2018, Qantas will operate additional services on the Sydney-Singapore, Sydney-Jakarta and Sydney-Numea routes. On December 12, the airline's Sydney to Numea service will increase from three to four times weekly. Then the next day, the Sydney-Jakarta service will increase from five to six times every week. And on December 14, a third Sydney-Singapore service will be added on Mondays, Fridays and Sundays, taking the total every week to 17. Qatar Airways is set to deploy its revolutionary Q-Suite business class offering on flights from Doha to Canberra via Sydney from July 1. The announcement comes less than six months after the airline launched its Canberra route in February 2018. The route will initially be served by Q-Suite up to four times per week, with daily Q-Suite service to commence on August 1. Q-Suite features the industry's first ever double bed available in business class, as well as private cabins for up to four people. There are privacy panels that stow away, allowing passengers in adjoining seats to create their own private room, a first of its kind in the industry. Fiji Airways has announced the introduction of a range of new benefits for Tabua Club members, along with an exclusive new tier called Tabua Club Plus. The changes also include new mechanisms for earning upgrade and status credits on both Fiji Airways and for the first time on Fiji Link. The move comes just a couple of weeks after the airline joined One World as the first One World Connect airline, and Tabua Club Plus members will get benefits like lounge access, priority check-in, and priority boarding when flying with American Airlines, British Airways, Cathay Pacific, and Qantas. Still in the South Pacific, an Air Tahiti Nui has unveiled a new look that will debut on the airline's new Boeing 787 Dreamliner fleet from November. The design and colours are inspired by the beauty and richness of the Polynesian islands, and the aircraft will feature Air Tahiti Nui's trademark tiare flower and a tattoo pattern representing a story of Tahiti and its people. Inside, the aircraft will feature flatbeds in business class and a whole new premium economy cabin that's set to be popular for Aussies and Kiwis heading to Tahiti. In hotel news, W Hotels are set to make its return to Sydney at the new Ribbon development in Darling Harbour in 2020. W Sydney will feature 593 guest rooms, suites and service apartments alongside the wet deck. The brands take on the hotel pool that will feature views of Darling Harbour. A restaurant serving up local flavours will also be a major feature and the hotel will also include two bars. W Sydney will also be home to the W brand signature away spa as well as a state-of-the-art gym and 925 square metres of event space, including a grand ballroom. Intercontinental Hotels Group has launched a new upscale hotel brand called Voco, with the first signing globally to be located in Australia. IHG says Voco is inspired by the meaning to invite or to come together in Latin, and will combine the charm of an individual hotel with the quality and reassurance of a global hotel chain. The first hotel to join the group in Australia will be the Watermark Hotel and Spa on the Gold Coast later this year. One of the fastest ways to get to New York is on Air Canada, which has just launched a new signature service in business class. Here's what it's all about. Air Canada's new signature service recently debuted on flights to and from Australia, and it's about enhancing customer service for those traveling in business class on wide-body aircraft. Air Canada Signature Service customers receive priority service at every stage of the journey, including access to airport concierge services, expedited check-in and security clearance, priority baggage handling and preferential boarding. Customers also enjoy Air Canada Maple Leaf Lounge access and a new range of meals have been created by celebrated Canadian chef David Hawksworth. When it comes to the onboard experience, a major highlight is the food from Hawksworth, alongside premium wines from Canada and across the world. There are also mattress pads to enhance the sleeping experience and new amenity kits from Want Les Essentials. Fast connections are available through Vancouver Airport from Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane, including immediate services to where we are right now, New York City. 
Hong Kong-based Avolo Hotels has been rapidly expanding in Australia in recent months. We spoke to the CEO and founder, Girish Junjun Jawala, to talk about that expansion, his plans for the US and Europe, and much more. Okay, Girish, thanks so much for your time today. We're here in New York, and uh, there's a lot of conferences going on. And how's the energy in the hotel industry right now for you globally, do you think? Oh, it's electrifying. Absolutely amazing. I mean, New York, especially in New York, a place like this, I mean, the energy levels are so high, and everybody at the conference is excited. Lots of things happening here. And you're expanding uh, quite rapidly in Australia. You've, you've acquired three properties in, in, the, in the recent months. Are you looking at, at the US? Are you looking at the UK still in terms of growth for Ovalo? Well, we're looking at growth for Ovalo everywhere. I mean, not just UK, but uh, also US now. Um, we, we definitely have plans to come in here. Uh, Australia continues to be our focus. Uh, we want to acquire more in Australia. And uh, we're probably uh, hopefully looking out for a portfolio of hotels that we can buy out. Yeah, because you've actually been going one by one by one by that's one. Right. And that's quite an arduous process in this industry, isn't it? Yes, it yeah. is. It is, James. You hit the nail on the head. And that was the way to go in the, in the early times. Uh, we were slow, slowly and steadily. Now that we know our model well, we know our customers, our customers know us, I think we can take a bigger leap and start acquiring larger hotels, uh, maybe a portfolio of hotels. And you're also notably getting a lot more business travelers coming through now as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Business and leisure both. Uh. Now you're a business traveler yourself. What, what, what things do you think that you guys offer that are great for business travelers and, and often from your travels and what you see and what, what else do you add to the group at the same time? Well, I think uh, our philosophy on the effortless living. I mean, we just believe that our guests should have, you know, just, just not have to think about anything. So with our all-inclusive uh, amenities, which is, you know, the free minibar, the free breakfast, the free social, a happy hour, you know, these are things that you don't have to think about, and it's all included. And this is great for a business traveler, I mean, especially like a free social hour, um, where you can meet the GM, you can meet other guests, and you can talk about restaurant experiences or anything like that. I think that's, a, that's some, some of the comments we get back from our guests that they really enjoy. So when you do take other hotels like Hotel Hotel or the New Inchcombe Hotel or the Emporium Hotel in Fortitude Valley, you're buying very, very good boutique hotels in their own right already. Do you have to do much to these hotels to bring them up to a standard for the group? Oh, absolutely. We, we literally almost got them all out and uh, redo the whole thing because some of them are quite dated and, um, and especially the services, how we do things. So it has to be a little bit more effortless. Uh, it has to be a little more vibrant and just, just, just to make it more overload. Just like all our other properties. And when you said you're looking at to buy potentially groups of hotels, this whole merger and acquisition process in the hotel industry right now we're seeing is really not slowing down by any means, is it? No, it's not. It's getting more and more exciting. And I think there's a lot of prospects for uh, boutique operators like us. And uh, I think we could do, there's a lot more I think acquisition we can look at, we can reposition and make into an overload. Uh, we also have another brand which just started. Uh, I think James has talked to you about that, which is Mojo Nomad which is our kind of take on the co-living micro hotel concept, which is even quite cool, it's quite interesting. But again, the, the whole take on the effortless living, where I guess is not to think much, but there's a small room, it works well, but you have a lot of communal spaces. So you'll have spaces where you can go and work, you can go and eat, you can go and drink and so on. So we see that concept happening quite, quite well here. We, I've visited quite a few number of hotels in New York that are following the same concept. I guess when they've got rooms of that size that you're talking about where it is spending less time in your room and more time actually either doing work off the lobby or using a meeting room or having Absolutely. food. Absolutely. They have a lot of communal spaces and the, the rooms are, I mean, they, they may be small in size, but they're really comfortable. I mean, every single thing is thought out of. So you will not feel that anything's missing or something has been squeezed out of it. So everything is there. And when you look at sort of opportunities then, then you, you're based in Hong Kong. Real estate's a very tricky proposition in Hong Kong. So this kind of concept is almost designed for cities where they are very built up, aren't they? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But I think this, um, well, it's, it can, certainly New York, Hong Kong, uh, Japan, Japan is very popular. Uh, but I think this can grow into other cities too, where people are happy just to have a small room and uh, have the space where they can go. And for single travelers as well as business travelers, it works for both ways. One of the most talked about hotel chains here in America is Dream Hotels. We spoke with CEO Jay Stein to find out their expansion plans and much more.
We've got uh, two here in New York City. We're at the Dream in Midtown right now. Uh, and our flagship is the Dream Downtown. Big property, 315 rooms, six uh, food and beverage venues, great rooftop bar. In Hollywood, a little different. It's even about 65% food and beverage revenue as compared to the hotel revenue. Uh, we've got uh, six different venues there, including a Tao restaurant, uh, Avenue Nightclub, uh, Beauty in Essex, uh, the Highlight Room, which is our rooftop bar in Hollywood, is 12,000 square foot space, and the one here in New York is 6,000, and the one you're in right now is almost 7,000, uh, the PhD that we're standing in right now. And a very in-demand segment lifestyle, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, I, I often say that our whole industry should have always been lifestyle, and uh, I think what Ian Schrager tapped into back in the mid-80s was really where our industry should have been going. And I think we got off target in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And it took about another 25, 30 years for the rest of the industry to say, you know what, uh, these big boxes of just plain vanilla is not really what's right. And uh, we got on board in the mid-90s, starting, opened our first lifestyle hotel in 99 with the Time Hotel here in New York. And that's where we put the company uh, ever since to just do lifestyle boutique type hotels. And now every brand, that's all they're putting out is lifestyle, which to me is that's what hotels should be. Highly stylized products, great food and beverage, a great local scene with, with, with local community. Um, and that's what hotels originally were and we just should never have gotten away from it. So uh, I don't really see them as lifestyle. I just see us back into the hotel business in general. That's what it should be. So this is a very exciting time for the company. You look at the segments that you're in, obviously, you, you appeal to the business traveler, you appeal to the leisure traveler, and obviously now the pleasure traveler, obviously, of course. Yeah, uh, as I said, it, it makes sense where we're positioning these hotels. This is where people want to go. And it, it's certainly in the, in the four and the four and a half star, like Dream and Time and Unscripted, it's easy to see that. But even in the luxury, you know, I don't think, uh, luxury is the same way as it was you know 10 and 15 years ago uh, we have a real modern luxury traveler that comes to to the chat world and it's not what you think of when uh, you think of the classic luxury properties that are out there uh, we're much more cutting edge our, our restaurants are vibrant and uh, uh, our mezzanine bar is live music and you know again locals that want to come and hang out and use the the uh, facilities Coming up after the break, our hotel special of Business Class continues. You're watching Business Class on Sky News Business. Welcome back to Business Class. Marriott International is the world's largest hotel chain. After it acquired Starwood Hotels and Resorts in 2016, it now has over 30 brands. We sat down with CEO Arnie Sorensen to talk about brands, expansion and much more. Arnie, thank you so much for your time today. We're here in New York and a very exciting day for you from a Sheraton brand standpoint, isn't it? Yeah, we're, we're revealing something that we have in mind for the public space of Sheraton, uh, which is an iconic brand. It's a big brand for us. It's the third biggest brand we've got in our portfolio of 30. Uh, and we're really showing this to hotel owners and developers so they see where we're taking the brand. And you're going very design driven, I can see by this space in here today. Well, the idea with Sheraton is uh, really twofold. One is, of course, about design. The other is really about Sheraton being the center of the community. Uh, and we think it's got that sort of lineage where people have come together all around the world and gathered. And we want to make sure we're bringing them back uh, to that place. And so we're developing space which is active through all parts of the day. Uh, we've got a communal table here, which really it really is almost like a library table that allows you to come and do your emails or do your work, or maybe have a small conversation. But we've also got bar, bar and coffee space so that we can bring people in and make sure that they're engaged with each other. Doing that, however, with a design flavor, which needs to be current, which needs to reflect the locale that the hotel is in. Uh, and we're really excited to reveal it. It's always exciting to uh, rejuvenate a brand, isn't it? You've done that a few times throughout your career, and yeah. now you're rejuvenating one of the most iconic brands, and you've got iconics thrown around a fair bit in this industry, yeah. but the Sheraton really is one of those brands. It is a brand that's known everywhere, uh, and it's a brand that didn't have enough discipline applied to it uh, these last few years. I think there were different reasons for that, uh, but, but part of it was that Starwood wasn't growing fast enough uh, independently, and so they really did not uh, probably act hard enough for the hotels that didn't meet standards. 
And if, of course, if you don't act for the hotels that don't meet standards, it means you have a hard time enforcing those standards. And so we knew when we stepped into Starwood, we wanted to make sure we worked with our brand teams, including legacy Starwood teams. We wanted to make sure we worked with our hotel owners to develop standards that people understood and uh, uh, bought, in, bought into. And then basically said, okay, these are the standards which we're going to apply. If you apply them, great, we'd love to have you in the system. If you're not committed to applying them, you're not going to be in the system. It's interesting when you look at uh, what's going on from a brand standpoint and legacy brands, and a lot of that comes back to loyalty again, doesn't it? And you're the, one of the biggest players in the world from a loyalty standpoint, and these are very brand loyal members that, that want to stick with their brand. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the SPG loyalists were fierce uh, uh, partisans, if you will. And from the moment we announced the acquisition of Starwood, they said, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? What are you going to do to our beloved program? And so we really have worked with them over the last uh, year and a half to say, what do you want? Now, uh, of course, within reason, uh, but we explained about a month ago how we were going to merge the two loyalty programs, Marriott Rewards and SPG, name yet to be revealed. Uh, what the terms, though, generally would be, and I think what we heard from our loyalists, both the Marriott Rewards and SPG, was we like that. Uh, this is a more powerful program than we had before, and we'll continue to stay with you. And you get a significant number of bookings from your loyalty program as well, don't you? High 50s of, uh, percentage of all of our business comes from loyalty members, nearing 60%. So it is a really powerful tool for us to make sure that the bulk of our customers are really our customers and not intermediated customers. And we've heard you talk a lot previously about the pleasure space. It's one of the most exciting spaces in the industry yeah. right now, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I think it's uh, driven by a couple of things, but we are all kind of working all the time because we have devices that allow us or require us to work all the time, depending on your perspective. What that also means is I think we all feel better about combining leisure even while we're working. So a business trip is no longer purely a business trip. It, it may be principally a business trip, but we're going to really want to experience the restaurant that we've heard so much about, or maybe go to a club, or as I did this morning, go for a run in the local uh, setting and experience something about that as, uh, location uh, and make sure we're getting joy not just from the work we're doing hopefully but also from the fun we get to have on the side. And you talk about before learning from Starwood and there's a good example there with, with the Western having uh, running teams that go out in the morning so you can take guests out for a run. Yeah. That's a, health and fitness is a huge thing for you. You've got brands that are that minded but you're also converting other brands to think more about that. Well I think with Weston of course it's a brand that has uh, uh, claimed the, uh, the fitness and health space for many many years. Uh, and it was a, a, a Weston associate crew I ran with this morning, including their run concierge who takes customers out uh, two times a week. They have a gear lending program. They sort of try and build it into the rhythm. Uh, and we announced something about uh, uh, contributing to Charity Miles, which is a nonprofit uh, in, in connection with our guests out there running. Uh, and, and so you see that in a brand like that. And Element, which Starwood had, of course, was another uh, health-focused brand. But in all the other brands, what you see is an increased focus on fitness centers, and an increased focus on the menu. Does the menu give us healthy options as well as sinful options, if you will? We still all love our burgers, uh, or we all love our, you know, depends on the part of the world, whatever your uh, favorite local comfort is, food is, we want that. But we also want to have the option at least to be healthy. Uh, and we'd like to have it made easy and fun for us. Every year, Miami plays host to one of the world's coolest hotel trade events called LE Miami. For the past six years, this hotel show has been focused on the contemporary jet set. We spoke to CEO and founder Serge Dive to find out more. Serge, we're here in Miami again and uh, you're putting on one of the best travel shows in the world, aren't you? Uh, well, we try and uh, we try to be modest what we do, but we certainly uh, try to smash the category whenever we do something, yes. especially for this show because it's about contemporary travel, so it has to be cutting edge and very different from everything that has even been done before, even by us. The hotels that are here, the people that are here, the collection that's here is, is pretty impressive. Yeah, we've got about uh, 520 exhibitors and, uh, and I think we've got very much the very best that the contemporary travel market has to offer. And, uh, and each of them is their, have their own point of view and their own individuality uh, in this world of travel. 
and you, the show's been around for about six years now and it's grown a little bit each year, and, but the quality has been maintained. Is this because of a global, you think, uh, trend in terms of the boutique, the luxury, the lifestyle hotels that are getting better and better and more prevalent around the world? I think that's the, is, uh, that's the market which is definitely building. I think that what we're seeing is the, the end of the cookie cutter factory. Uh, people are, customers are looking to be surprised. Uh, they are uh, looking to have an emotional connection. Uh, 20 years ago, they wanted to be sheltered from the environment. They wanted to be feeling safe. Now they want to feel engaged. They want to feel connected. Uh, they want to feel surprised. Uh, and therefore, there is this huge boom around the world to create the, all these amazing hotels, whatever it is from independent hotelier or even from big brand that needs to embrace this movement of contemporary boutique hotel. And when it comes to business travel as well, Serge, so everyone goes to these conferences, these events, these what you put on. A lot of it's face to face. People want face to face contact now, don't they, with meetings? Yes, I think that's uh, one of the greatest sentences I've, uh, I've read over the last three years. It's like the, the, the future of digital is not in your iPhone, it's in the real world. Uh, and I think that what we're saying is that I think because there is more and more uh, connect, digital connections, people are actually craving physical contact. Uh, and what we're seeing is that. Uh, uh, is that a return to the business the way we have been for thousands of years, which is like no longer via just emails and just fax or letters, but we are rediscovering the, this capacity to be like a small shopkeeper but in a global village where we need to rediscover these values like how is little Johnny and how are you doing? So now we, we return to those values that where you do business with people that you trust, you trust people you like, and you like people that you share experience with. So what we're trying to do over here is create a world very immersive, but where there is a lot of shared experience between all our delegates. Well, that's it from us in New York. Thanks for watching and see you next time as we check into some of the Big Apple's best hotels.